Um, because it's a genius program and it's about great ideas, I thought what best, what better than to introduce Einstein and his great idea, right? So, um, so we start off with uh, today's talk, which is on the great idea of Einstein that changed um, science forever. And this came about 100 years ago. So we'll talk about Einstein's great idea and why it is a great idea and why I consider Einstein to be one of the geniuses of our time. And also talking about what, why it was outrageous, why it came out of the blue. And in many of these great ideas will come out of the blue. It doesn't come from routine work that you do in science. And we'll talk about the consequences of, uh, of, of, these, uh, of this great idea. So this name, outrageous, uh, Einstein's outrageous legacy, is not original. I did not formulate it. This came from this book by Kip Thorne, who you know got the Nobel Prize a few years ago for the discovery of gravitational waves. And uh, <clears throat> it talks about some things to be Einstein's outrageous legacy. And I'm going to talk about not time warps, but black holes a little bit today. But the, the idea that Einstein had led to some very, very interesting consequences. So today, I'm going to talk about, uh, when I talk about gravity, how Einstein thought of gravity as a, as a, as a new way of looking at gravity. And uh, I'm going to talk about two consequences of that. And one of them um, is what Einstein predicted and saw happen in his lifetime. And sometimes when you have a, a new idea, you often don't know whether it's going to work or not. And many people have put forth ideas which maybe 100 years later, some other people have uh, put into work or seen it to work. And in Einstein's case, such things happened. And so I'm going to talk about another thing that happened about 100 years after Einstein's uh, work predicted it. But um, he never thought that we would see it. But 100 years after Einstein, uh, we now have seen gravitational waves. So I'm going to talk about gravitational lensing. The basic um, ideas of it were laid down in Einstein's work and which he saw happen during his lifetime, and gravitational waves, which uh, we have now detected 100 years after, so after the great idea. So let's talk about Einstein first, and why, in the case of a genius program, I would talk about Einstein first. <clears throat> so let's see, why is this idea new? Gravitation or gravity is something that all of you have come across in some way or another in school. When you read physical sciences or physics, the first thing that um, you come across are some laws of motion from Newton. And as a consequence of that, you also come across the idea of gravitation. And what happens in the way Newton thought about it more than 300 years ago was that gravity is a force that acts between any two things that have mass, right? So it could be you, or the sun and the moon, or galaxies, two galaxies, or whatever, right? So anything that has mass attracts another thing that has mass with a force that is proportional to the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. And so what happens is that if something is, is, is uh, gravitating, it, it essentially is pulling something else with a force of gravity. And the acceleration as a result goes as um, the mass of this person, that's, this, this object that's pulling, divided by r squared. And as a result, that is an acceleration that the other object um, experiences, right? So this is your general acceleration due to gravity. And this is how Newton thought about it. And since then, everybody's thought about gravity as a pull, a force. 
And this is how in school you are taught and you will be taught that gravity is. Now I'm going to tell you something that Einstein did was to revise this notion of gravity. Now this is something that you are never going to be taught at school. Because it's a new way of looking at gravity but it's very hard to understand in terms of school physics. Now I don't want you to go back to your science teacher and say look but this guy in, in Ashoka told me that all Newton did was wrong. So please don't teach me this. It is very important for you to know that I, what Newton did, the way Newton thought about gravity is not wrong. It works very well and this is why it is simple and this is why you're taught this in school. And in fact, if you take Newton's way of looking at gravity and you work out your general problems in science, almost all cases, all practical cases, it works. But in some cases, Newton's idea of looking at gravity fails, and I'm going to talk about where it fails, and why Einstein needed to think about it in a completely different way, which shows his genius. Okay. So it doesn't mean that Newton was wrong. It's just Newton's description of gravity, which is the most common force or interaction in the universe, is incomplete. But it works in most cases. Right? So for example, we know, so you, you've all heard the story of Newton sitting under an apple tree and watching the apple fall and realizing that the apple is pulled by the earth and then he thought that it's uh, the same force that makes the moon go around the earth or the earth go around the sun and the apple is falling to the earth. They're all the same. That is a kind of leap of faith for a genius to say that these things are the same. By the way, when Newton actually came across this, this came to this conclusion, he was at home, actually not at home, but home with his aunt, in, uh, during a time when his university was closed for one and a half years due to a pandemic. And this is why when we were all sent home from university, I could try telling people this is not necessarily a bad thing. Newton was spending, it turned out his university, Cambridge University, was closed for 18 months because of the plague. And he had nowhere to go. He had gone to live with his aunt, and these apple trees were in the garden of his aunt. And he would sit under trees every day and, and, and do his work. And during that year and a half, Newton discovered calculus, the differential calculus. Newton worked out the binomial theorem and Newton worked out gravitation, right? So all this happened within a year. And this, in, in, in uh, terms in science, often we call Newton's year of miracles, annus mirabilis, right? And I'm going to talk about Einstein's similar year a little later. In one year, driven by the pandemic, Newton came up with all these ideas. Now, Einstein, long time later, at the beginning of the 20th century, started thinking about whether this description of gravity is complete or not. And he would come up, and I'll come in a minute, come up with an idea in 1915, where he will show that gravity is not really a force, but you can think of gravity in a different way, and I'll come to back. But let me talk about Newton first. Einstein's Annus Mirabilis, which is his year of uh, miracles, came in 1905. Einstein, remember, Einstein, for geniuses often, don't work in conventional workplaces. Einstein did not work at a university at that time. He was working at a clerk in a, in a patent office, looking at various patent applications and looking at whether they are right or not. And he was also in parallel working on a PhD thesis at the university. And in this year, he came up with some very interesting ideas. One of them was he discovered the, the theory behind the photoelectric effect. It is a photoelectric effect is such that when 
light falls on the material, it lets go of some electrons and leads to electric current. This is one of the major ways when one now uses um, detect light detectors. You know, even the digital detectors, digital cameras in your phone basically use this method. And in fact, later on, Einstein got the Nobel Prize for this effect. So he came, came and, and actually found this on, in March that year. And later on in this year, he wrote a paper on what is known as Brownian motion, which is random motions of all particles, like the gas in this room, for example. He, he published a paper on that. But later that year, I don't know what's happening to my thingy, he published two papers which changed the face of what we, how we think about light and how things move in the universe. And it comes to this from an idea that he had when he was less than your age. When Einstein was a teenager work, uh, in school, he started thinking about certain anomalies that in the, in the, in the science that, that he was taught in school. He at that time lived with his uncle, who was a physics teacher. His parents had moved away, they'd gone to live in Italy and, and left him with his uncle, who was a physics teacher. And his uncle had, had been teaching him physics a lot in, at home. And at the age of 15, he gave his uncle a birthday present, which was an essay on physics. Now, I don't know how many of you have given birthday presents to your uncles, which is an essay in physics. He wrote an essay on physics, and that, is, that was his birthday present for his uncle. And in that essay, he brought up this following um, idea. And this is where, you know, you're talking of great ideas, talking about geniuses. At age 15, Einstein is thinking of the following thing. He's thinking that if I move at the speed of light, and I have a mirror in front of me, Will I be able to see my face in that mirror? How do you see your face in the mirror? Light gets reflected from your, your face that goes to the mirror and comes back and you see them, right? But if the mirror is moving at the speed of light, will the light be coming back and will you be able to see your face? Not many 15-year-olds think in these terms. And this kind of thinking led him to think about what is the nature of the space in which light travels in, right? How does light travel through the space to get to another place, right? He also thought about the following thing. What if, and you will see soon how this is related. He thought about the nature of gravity and was thinking about how, if it was a force, like Newton had conceived it, how does that work? So for example, if two things are moving, and they are attracting each other through the force of gravity, he asked the question, if, you, if both things are moving, and gravity is a force which has a certain direction, how does this thing know which direction that force is coming from? Because this has moved, right? So unless the communication between the two things that are pulling each other is absolutely instantaneous, does not take any time, then there is no way of one of them to know which direction they're being pulled from. Because this is, by the time this is known about this force, this has moved, right? And Einstein started asking the question, does information travel at a certain speed if one um, of the two things that are pulling each other, does it know about this pull instantaneously, or does it take time? He's thinking about these things, in all these things he's writing down at age 14, 15, 16, when he's in school. And this later on goes into this fantastic thing that he writes in 1905 in that paper I talked about. And he says, everything makes sense, and I'll show you 
all of these little anomalies that I've noticed will make sense if you make this postulate that the speed of light is absolutely constant no matter how fast the source is moving. Now that's a very revolutionary concept. It's a great idea. Why is it revolutionary? Because according to Newton, Galileo, etc., if you have things that have velocities, they add up. So for example, you're swimming in a river and the river, the water also has a, has a speed. Then your net speed is your speed of swimming plus the speed of the water. If there's a train that is going and you throw a ball inside the train, for somebody who's looking from outside, the ball is going at a speed that has the speed of the ball, speed at which you threw it, plus the speed of the train. But Einstein is saying that if you have light and you are on a train and you have pressed the button of the torch, the light that is coming out and you see light move at a certain speed, inside the train you see the thing moving at a speed and the person sitting outside will not see the speed of light as the light speed plus the speed of the train. They will see the same speed of light. You see why we call this a great idea? This is very, very different from what you think. And he's putting all these different things together and has come up with uh, an idea and he says that let's assume that this is true. And then in that paper in 1905, which we now call the paper of the special theory of relativity, he shows that a lot of things that you see that seem to be contradicting each other go away if you make that assumption that light, the speed of light is constant no matter where it comes from. Okay. Now that leads him in 1915 to a much more general theory which incorporates this and it's called the general theory of relativity which he publishes 10 years later in which he incorporates this into a larger theory which explains gravity. And this is how he explains gravity. He says gravity, Newton had said, is a force between two things. I ask you the question, if two things are pulling each other and they're moving, how do they know that they're, which direction they're being pulled from? Einstein comes up with this idea that gravity is not a force. It is because it, it comes from the fact that anything that has mass distorts space around it. Do you see what it means? So here you are. The earth is being pulled by the sun and the earth is going around the sun. Newton would say that there is a force between the two and the sun is pulling the earth and as a result the earth is going around. Einstein says that because the sun is massive, it has made a dip in space around it. And the earth is a thing that is caught in that dip and is moving around. Now, Earth also has created a dip in space-time like that. And maybe the moon, which is near here, is caught in that dip and it's moving around the Earth. So gravity is actually an effect locally of something that is massive, which is distorted space. You can do this yourself. You can take a bed sheet and have two or three people pull it like taut like this and you put a very heavy thing in the middle and you'll see it will dip like that, right? And you, you, you put a little marble or something like that and it will go around and be inside that dip in the bed sheet. That kind of idea. Now in Newton's idea, space doesn't exist. It's vacuum. And this is what you will be taught in school. In Einstein's idea, space has a character and it can be bent. What is, how would you test the, whether this is right or that is right? Is everybody with me? Yes. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Yes. 
Do you understand the difference between the two? Do you see what I just said about Einstein? How that explains this situation about what I said? Like two things moving very fast. How do they know about each other? Because Einstein says nobody's pulling each other with a string. I feel the interaction of gravity because one thing just distorts space-time. So it's a local effect. It is not a long-range communication between two things. So in moving the idea that the, the, the effect of gravity is local to around the, the thing that is moving, that, that, is, that is pulling, that is causing the interaction, you change this question of whether the communication between the two objects can be at the at a certain speed or not, right? Yes. So, sir, the Earth, the Yes. So, what happens is that the space, exactly, space around the Earth, is 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 curved because of the Earth's mass, and you are trapped on Earth because of that. Right? You can't, if you jump, you can't get away from Earth. Because space is, is, is bent because of that. And I'll show you in a minute how that translates into other things. And you can have, think about this idea. Now, if you go back to school and tell your teacher, you know, don't teach me Newton anymore. Because somebody has just told me that gravity is actually, you see that these are actually compatible with each other. They work together very well. Newton is actually telling you how to calculate things in a context where the curvature of space is not that important. Because for anything to do with people in this room, Newton's laws apply very well. Because you are not you know, curving space as much the sun is, or the galaxy is. Your mass is not that much, right? But in certain cases, this will become important. I'll show you in a minute how this will become important. So how would you distinguish between Einstein's way of looking at it, which is something massive distorts space, and something massive, uh, and, and, and gravity is uh, just an interaction between the two. So here is one way you can do it. Newton, in Newton's theory, light does not have any mass. Right? Light is just made up of photons, stream of photons going one after the other. Light is massless. So gravity can't affect light. Okay? In Einstein's theory, it doesn't matter whether light has, has mass or not. Light is going from one part to another part of the universe, and it is following space. And Einstein says that a very massive thing is sitting here, so it distorts space. And so as light goes from one part of the universe to another, it has to go along space and it will curve. So gravity is you know, affecting light. And in Newton's case, gravity does not affect light. So here is, so this is why I said there are certain things that happened in Einstein's lifetime to show that what he was thinking was right. So Einstein's idea of gravity is you have space, light is going from one part of the universe to another, and you have a massive object like a star sitting there, and so locally space is curved. So light going from here to here will pass, and in passing so will bend, because it, it follows the bent space time. So what will happen is, if the star is there and astronomer is sitting with the telescope there, then they will see the star in a different place because the light is bent. But this will not happen in Newton's theory because in Newton's theory, gravity has no effect on light. So, within, so when Einstein published his theory of gravity in 1915, the Second World War was going on. This was published in German in a German journal. Not many people outside Germany read it, and you would be very happy to know that the first people in the English-speaking world who read it were Indians, or among the first people. And the first person, the first people to translate Einstein's paper in German actually were in India, into English. 
there were two young uh, physicists, Nengnath Saha and S.N. Bose, sitting in Calcutta, actually got this journal. They translated the first English translation of Einstein's paper into English was done by these two people, who later became very famous themselves. Saha and Bose are greatest names in Indian science. But they were then young lecturers at Calcutta University. They, they, pub they translated this, and that their version, in the English version, went out to a lot of people. And just after the Second War ended, um, huh? sorry, First War ended, the First World War ended, people in the English-speaking world, particularly in America and, and the US, uh, in the UK, started taking notice of this, this uh, general theory of relativity. And a person in Cambridge, the professor of astrophysics, Arthur Eddington, was very, very interested in this and said, OK, we can find a way of verifying this. And how would you verify this? You see, if you look at stars in the sky, and you see their positions, you can measure their positions very accurately, taking a picture. OK? Now, think about stars behind the sun. So the sun is here, and the stars are behind the sun. And the light is coming to you from behind the sun. So as the light passes by the sun, it will bend. And so you should see, as I showed you in that picture, the stars to be in a different place. OK? So Eddington said, let's look at stars behind the sun. Whether, when the sun is there, you see the stars in a different place. Because six months later, the sun will not be there. And you can take a picture of the same place. And the stars will be different places, right? So when the sun is there, the stars will move out a little. And the sun is not there. We are looking away from the sun six months later. If you take a picture, they should not be. You understand? Everybody understands this? But now tell me, how would you see the stars behind the sun? Because when the sun is in the sky, it's daytime. Right? So this is a good idea. Yes? Exactly. There you are. That's, that's, the, that's the great idea here. That during a solar eclipse, you can see the stars that are behind the sun. So Eddington asked, when is the next solar eclipse? It turned out that in 1919, there was a solar eclipse that can be seen, seen off the west coast of Africa. And he took a ship and a telescope and his summer colleagues, and he set sail there. I've actually seen the, the pictures that he took myself. And actually, I've held that plate, which is a, a real amazing experience. So I, Eddington took these amazing plates during a solar eclipse and found that the stars, May 29, 1919, <laughs> there was a solar eclipse. Moon passed in front of the sun. And that is this hand-drawn picture of what they found. They found that w during the eclipse, the stars moved outwards a little bit. Because he compares that with picture taken of the same part of the sky six months later, when the sun is away. The sun is not away. The Earth is in a different place going around the sun. So this was the picture taken from Principe Island off the west coast of Africa. 1919, this word gets out, and Einstein is very, very happy. Einstein is like a child. He writes a letter to his mother, Liebe Mutter. Dear mother, this English scientist has gone and proved my theory right. I don't know whether if you prove something right, the first person you write to is your mother, but he did, right? <laughs> He's very, 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 very happy. Front page of all newspapers. Einstein's theory triumphs. His new idea. Because it's such a great experiment, isn't it? It shows the difference. That's another thing in science, that if you're doing something new, it's not enough for you to say that this is new. You have to show that it has a consequence that can be experimentally proved. And of course, the previous theory would not give that result. Right? Here's a very clear-cut case where Newton's theory would say, no, nothing would happen. You take a picture of a star field during an eclipse. Six months later, you take the same picture. They will be the same. In Einstein's case, just because of the 
the, the reason I showed you, it has a different prediction. It shows that the stars move out, and during when, when the star is coming by, the starlight is coming by the sun, and other times the star field is different. That's another thing in science that you have to actually have such very stark differences so that you can show that one works and the other does not. So this was a very good example of such a, such a case where you could say that Newton's prediction was not wrong, right, right? Now, this doesn't prove that Newton is wrong. It just shows that Newton's theory does not work for certain things. And Einstein is generalizing the theory of gravity and showing you that for such cases, he has a theory which works much better. OK? So this is a very good example. And that's why I said, so this is now known as gravitational lensing, the, <coughs> the effect in which having a mass somewhere in the universe causes light to bend, and thus it causes optical illusions. Right? Because as light bends, your eye cannot follow light along bent paths, and so it causes these illusions. <coughs> so what happens now, of course, 100 years later, we have bigger telescopes. We can do amazing stuff with this. So you have a galaxy, and you're observing from here, and light is coming from that galaxy. And on the way, it passes through all kinds of matter. And in many cases, you don't see this matter. It's called dark matter. But you can sense this matter by the fact that the light is bent on the way. So here's how it works. I'm, I'm calling this mirages in the sky because these are optical illusions in the sky. And actually, you'll see, because there's matter everywhere in the universe, almost every, everything you see in the sky is an illusion. So here is something, and then there is a galaxy on the way, say, and there's a light source very far away. And you're looking at it, and because the light is coming by this galaxy that has mass, it is bent. Now, if they are completely in line with each other, you will see the faraway galaxy as a circle. Why? Because light is coming from it and is bending and coming to you. But there is no preferred way that you can have this light come from. So you will see the, the original source as a circle. But if they're not perfectly aligned, you will see that these, this ring breaks up into multiple images. So what you see is that you have light coming from this coming to you on this path and this path, but your eye sees them in two different places at the same time. Now, this is a mad idea, that you see multiple copies of the same thing, and not just multiple copies, something that is distorted into a circle. Do we see it? Of course we do. These are what we know call Einstein rings. That's exactly what's happening here. You see a faraway source, a galaxy, which is actually a point source, but you see them like that. Here are some very good examples from the Hubble Space Telescope, where you can see either full rings or partial rings. And that thing that you see as a ring is actually a single galaxy that's very, very far away. It's a point source. But you're looking at it. Again, Newton's theory would not have predicted this. Einstein would have been very happy to see this now. Yeah, that we can see these now. And not only that, because the lenses can be galaxies or clusters of galaxies with dark matter, they're far more complex than the picture I just drew. So you see faraway galaxies like this. So for example, this is a fantastic picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in which you can see all these distorted images these are called arcs. These are all single galaxies that look like this. But because light is bending, you're seeing them in these distorted fashion. In fact, that galaxy and that galaxy and that galaxy are the same thing. And I can show you they're the same thing. Because you can take a spectrum, and the spectrum is like a, a fingerprint. You can see exactly the same thing. And you can see them in different places, in different levels of distortion. What is the use of all this? The, see, this is another thing. You know, that, that is a single galaxy that look like, actually looks like this. But the mass of 
the cluster of galaxies or the, or the galaxy in the foreground is distorting it. Now, working from that, you can work out how much matter there is in the thing that is causing this distortion. This is the most easy way and the most direct way of measuring mass in the universe. A lot of the matter in the universe is dark. They don't emit light. But in something like this, you can figure out how much matter there is associated with this galaxy, and you actually get a measure of the mass. Yes? Huh. So um, the, the question is, can you explain the thing you said about the spectrum? So I'm not going to talk about spectrum today much, but when you take an image, hmm, you take an image at a, at a, in, at a particular wavelength of light, because it, it, you, you actually have, your camera has a certain, um, a certain wavelength sensitivity, and you take an image at a particular wavelength. But if you pass the light through something that breaks up the light into its different colors, like a prism or a grating, then you can see the same object, but you can look at the distribution of energy across the spectrum. So you can see the energy as a function of, uh, see, see how much light there is a function of energy or function at wavelength. And that's called a spectrum. Now, a spectrum, I'm not talking of spectra much today, but a spectrum normally has a lot of information. It has a lot of information about the chemical composition of the object, because different um, chemical elements have different signatures in the spectrum. It can also tell you about how fast things are moving and things like that. Now, a spectrum, because it depends on the chemical composition of an object, is pretty unique to an object. Huh. So what I said was, if you ask the question of all the different images that you see, are they of the same thing? I can argue that if I take a spectrum that is like a fingerprint, it, can, it is pretty unique to that object. And so from that, you can say that that belongs to that object. You see the same spectrum from something else in the field, which looks very similar, and also has the same spectrum. So it's likely they're the same thing. That's what I'm saying. <clears throat> so I said nice pictures, but what can this lensing do for you? It, what it, lensing does for us as astronomers are wonderful things. For example, it magnifies, lenses magnify, as you know. So it magnifies light. So it helps us now look at some of the farthest things in the universe, because they pass through matter, which has distorted space. And as a result, it focuses light towards us, like lenses do. You take a magnifying glass, and you actually see something that is magnified. So if, you look, if you've seen some of the great pictures that are coming out of the James Webb Space Telescope, and you're finding things that are far away, a lot of them you are seeing because they are far away. Here are some examples of that. You know, these things, these are the farthest galaxies that we've found so far, some of them. And many of them are there because they're near a galaxy, and this is magnifying that galaxy. And so you can see, so the gravitational lensing is acting as a magnifying glass. In fact, one of my students did a PhD thesis a long time ago. He's now a professor in the of Science, which where we predicted that we will see distant supernovae, stars, individual stars exploding because of this effect of magnification of gravitational lenses. And this we predicted 30 years ago, and now people are starting to see them. People are looking at individual stars exploding in faraway galaxies because they are magnified by gravitational lensing of galaxies nearby. So that's wonderful. So these are the biggest magnifying glasses in the universe. The other thing is, I just wanted to say one thing about this interesting thing and uh, interesting effect, which also shows the question she asked, which is about these diff two different things in the sky how do you know they're the same thing? Here's an example of two objects that I claim is essentially two images of the same object. Okay? Now, what happens in sources in the sky is that they vary with time. 
for various reasons. It could be sources that are coming from near a black hole and the black hole is attracting some matter, something goes up and down, etc. Now, because you're seeing two things in the sky which are images of the same thing, because they are resulting from two different trajectories of light, they will have slightly different lengths. And so something happens in the source, you will see the same thing happening in the other image a little later, not at the same time, because the light is traveling two different distances. Here's a good example where, in this particular case, that thing had a variation. And so this is a radio telescope image of that, um, um, that, that source, but plotted as a function of time. And you can see it goes up and down. But the other one is from that source. And you can see the same thing that's happening here happens 400 days later in the other one. So it clearly tells you they're the same thing. But 400 days later, and from the 400 days later, you can actually figure out the geometry of the two paths and then figure out exactly how far away something is okay, from this exercise. So these are wonderful things that start coming out of this study of gravitational lensing. There's one thing to discover that it, it exists, but then people now use it as a tool to do all kinds of things, to measure masses, to measure distances, all kinds of things. And this is very exciting field, extremely exciting field. So I'm going to skip now and go to the next bit. And I'm hoping that I have another 10, 15 minutes. Is that all right? Do I? OK. <clears throat> so I told you that Einstein's idea was that space-time is curved. I'm calling it space-time because that's, that's how he formulated it. Space and time are related. And the fabric of space was called space-time. So go back to this picture. Another effect. So one effect we talked about was what Einstein had predicted and that is space will be curved, and as a result, uh, light will travel in curved trajectories. The other thing that you could find was that <clears throat> this will lead to amazing things, amazing effects in the universe. For example, black holes, which all of you have heard of, can essentially be thought of in terms of this effect of of, of curving space-time. For example, if you have a very, very massive object that exists in space but has a very small size, then it can curve space so much that even light cannot come out of that, that curvature. And that is called a black hole. A black hole is such a space which Einstein, Einstein's idea says that it curves space so much that light cannot come out. Even light cannot come. Light doesn't have the energy to come out. And if light cannot come out of something, then you call it a black hole. Right? So this is another way of looking at, um, looking at black holes. Black holes are stars that have collapsed, and, and their entire matter has gone into a very small size. And so it has then curved space so much that light cannot come out of that. And if you do that, then you come to another. So here, for example, is a consequence of Einstein's relativity and what black holes are. Black holes would be collapsed objects that are so small that light cannot come out of them. And their size comes straight out of uh, this theory of gravitation that Einstein wrote down in 1915. And it's called the Schwarzschild radius. And it gives you the size of a black hole. It's Oops. 2 gm over c squared, c being the speed of light, m being the mass of the object, and g being the normal gravitational constant that comes out of Newton. This means it shows you that if you take the Earth and make it less than a centimeter in size, it will become a black hole. Anything can become a black hole. You can become a black hole. You put your mass in there. Your mass is, what, 40 kilograms, 50 kilograms, or whatever. You put it in there and calculate how much you can do this calculation yourself. And you find out 
that you have to compress yourself into a size that is pretty mind-boggling. It will probably be one thousandth of a millimeter or something like that. And then you can become a black hole. And so why aren't you becoming a black hole? Because it's impossible to do that. And somebody tells you the Earth will turn into a black hole. It won't happen because who's going to squeeze the Earth into, uh, into one centimeter? But the sun, if it becomes less than three kilometers, it will turn into a black hole. It's not happening to the sun. But for many stars, it can happen. And that's a different lecture. I won't go there. In the universe, there are many kinds of black holes. There are black holes that are star-like black holes. Stars have become black holes. And then there are black holes that are very, very uh, massive, which are in the centers of galaxies. And one of the consequences of Einstein's theory is that if black holes merge with each other or hit each other, it can create certain effects that you can, uh, can find. And this is what, what happened a few years ago when gravitational waves were discovered, and it led to the Nobel Prize. <clears throat> and I'll briefly talk about this. So I just told you that Einstein predicted that light can bend in space-time. But another thing can happen is that massive objects, when they collide with each other, they can create ripples in space. Just like if you throw something in a pond, you see ripples go on the, on the surface of the pond, you can see ripples in space-time. Right? That, is also, that comes out of Einstein's theory. It won't, it won't come out with Newton's theory of gravity. Because in Newton's theory of gravity, space does not exist. Einstein is saying that if you move through space, it's going to create ripples on, on space itself. And then Einstein, in 1916, a year later, year after his original paper, wrote another paper showing that nobody can ever detect this. He's, he actually predicted that these ripples will exist. He called it gravitational waves. And then he said, it's impossible to detect because the effect on space is going to be so small, nobody can measure it. Right? And this is exactly what happened 100 years later. In 2015, these ripples were actually discovered. And that was, that's what led to the Nobel Prize. And I'll show you very briefly why it is so difficult, how it was they were, they were found, and why are we talking about this. So <clears throat> actually, if you look at the amount of displacement that you need, in order to measure these things, how much is space-time vibrating as a result of these, these most massive things colliding with each other? So if you take two black holes, which are the most dense objects in the universe, and you have them collide with each other and, and form another black hole, that is going to create a vibration of space-time that is of the order of 10 to the power minus 18 meters. Now, what is it? I mean, if you look at your hair, it is about 100 microns, which is about 10,000 times thinner than, than a meter. Your, the wavelength of light is about a micrometer, a millionth of a meter, a micron, right? The diameter of an atom is about 10 to the power minus 10 meters. The diameter of a nucleus inside an atom is 10 to the power minus 15 meters. And here we are talking about two black holes colliding and space vibrating at 10 to the power minus 18 meters. That's even smaller. So this is why Einstein said, look, this is what's going to happen. And you'll never, ever detect it. But imagine that humans have done this now. We have detected the vibration in space as a result of what Einstein predicted. How has that happened? What happens is that as a gravitational wave goes through, goes through space, it, it makes space vibrate in a very, very interesting way. It, it, the vibration happens in one direction, and then expansion happens in one direction, and contraction happens in that direction, right? So what we've done is we've set up a system and as you go into university, you are going to use this system yourself. It's called a Michelson interferometer. What happens is that there is a light that comes, say, from a laser, and it's split into two. And it goes into two perpendicular directions, one this way and one that way. 
and it comes back and joins back, and it's in perfect equilibrium. As the, as the gravitational wave goes through the system, this one part contracts and the other part expands, and so they go out of balance. See if this works, and I'll show you how this happens. Right? It's in equilibrium. Now, this part has, do you see what happens? So when this part contracted and that part expanded, it went completely out of equilibrium and it could be detected, right? So this magnifies this effect such that you can actually detect it. Now this is done over two arms like this that are four kilometers long. And this is called the LIGO Observatory, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory. And four kilometers long, the light is going like that and coming back. And it's actually two beams of light, which come from the same laser source, combining to create an equilibrium. And then we're waiting for a gravitational wave to pass. Maybe two black holes merge somewhere, and they will send the gravitational wave. And it will come, and this particular four kilometer arm is going to contract, and that particular four kilometer arm is going to expand, and it's going to go out of equilibrium. It's such an outrageous idea that this will work, but it worked, right? In September 2015, this particular observatory, there are two of these in the US, one in the northwest corner and one in the south. They detected the same gravitational wave from two merging black holes. <clears throat> two merging black holes. <clears throat> and this was, sorry, no. This was the signal. What they saw was that there was some noise coming and then suddenly there was a signal that was shown and it vanished. And the whole thing lasted one fifth of a second. Right? And this is this happened like two black holes going around each other, and they came very close to each other, and then they merged. This is exactly the signal that you find. You can, you can predict by looking at what will happen if this happens, what will happen to space time around black holes, what the nature of the gravitational wave is, OK? Now, this is important because India is now going to build the third of these. There are two of these in the US, one there and one there. When it was discovered, a lot of hullabula happened. As you can see, Amul had a, had a great um, ad on it. People started wearing dresses with, uh, with these waveforms on it, etc. But now, as a result of the LIGO discoveries, we have found 50 such sets in the last five years of black holes that have been created by other black holes merging. Two black holes merging to create one. 50 such events have been discovered. And next week, the next experiment is starting in the US. And it will now discover, we believe, one of these events every week. Now we have these two LIGO detectors there. They're routinely di discovering gravitational waves. That's a consequence of Einstein, which Einstein said you can never discover. But we've done it. And there's one going to come up in here, in the middle of Maharashtra. Whoops. Here's what happened last month. And Professor Vijay Raghavan is one of the people who's absolutely instrumental in making this happen. And that India government has now announced that the money will come to build the third of this one. In India, this is going to be the first really international big scientific facility, which will be world beating, absolutely. The entire world's scientists will come to India to use this, right? We normally Indian scientists go abroad to use their facilities. This is now the first really big international facility. I mean, there are others. I mean, in astronomy, for example, there's the GMRT, et cetera. But this will be the truly, the first truly big, big international collaboration that will be situated in India and it's going to give us and you an opportunity to work 
in India with experimental facilities that are here. And this will detect gravitational waves along with the two other American um, observatories. So this will be built over the next seven, eight years. The money has just been announced now. And so it will take about seven, eight years to build. So by the time you have gone through university and are coming out at the other end, trained in doing physics, some of you, I'm sure, will work with LIGO. It's going to be built here in the middle of Maharashtra. And the four institutions who are building it are in that, in that region. One of them is the institution that I work for in Pune. Um, that's what it looks like now in Hingoli district. It's a big piece of land, four kilometers that way, four kilometers that way. Two tunnels will be built with the biggest vacuum in the world inside it. And lasers will go back and forth and create this amazing experiment. That's what it's going to be like. That's the architect's plan. We don't know what it will look like in the end. And uh, <coughs> this is the kind of stuff that we'll have to build in India. This is what exists in the US. I, I, I don't think that in India such amazing equipment has been ever built. And we are aspiring to do this. And I'm not going to do this. People like you will do this, really. Yes. I'll come in a minute, I'll, a very good time. So here you can see that we're going around there and talking to the villagers, talking to the schools, talking to ch children like you, and telling them this is coming there. And we, are, we actually want people in Hingoli district to know that there will be a, a, a thing like that um, um, go, you know, being built in Maharashtra. Finally, and you can follow us on Twitter and, and, and social media. And finally, I'll just leave you with a, a few books to read about this subject, um, all that I've talked about, um, Life of Einstein and books on black holes and, and gravitational waves and gravitational lensing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> now let's see what. These things as long as possible because of the following reason. Because the theory gives you the, how much the space's distortion will be Okay, in terms of a ratio, it tells you that space is going to be distorted by a fraction, which is 10 to the power minus 21. Okay, which means that the 10 to the power minus 21 times the length of what you're observing. So if you take a ruler, the distortion will be 10 to the power minus 21 meters or whatever or feet. So you want to make it as big as possible so that the, the actual distortion is as big as possible. But what you're doing is you're taking a laser and pointing it to a mirror. And it comes back to you. Now what happens beyond four kilometers is that the earth curves. So if you put something five kilometers away the mirror is going to be down there. So you'll need a much bigger mirror. So the size of the mirror that we use is about half a meter across. And for that, the maximum you can put away is four kilometers. If you, if you want to put that mirror 10 kilometers away, you'll need mirrors this big. Now, people are trying to solve that. So Europe is now trying to build what is called the Einstein telescope, which will be 10 kilometers long. But they are doing it, they are thinking of doing it underground, like CERN. <clears throat> and if you do it underground, then the curvature of the Earth doesn't matter. Japan has already done one, one underground. So that's, you know, you don't think of the curvature of the Earth all the time, right? But here's a good example in which the curvature of the Earth actually catches you. You, know, you, you put a mirror very far away, it's going to go down. Anybody else? Uh, I understood how the distance works, but I wanted to ask you how is mass calculated using Einstein rings? Good point. So very, very good question. And of course, uh, you know, you can look this up uh, when you go away as very standard uh, methods in all textbooks, etc. But I'll tell you how. Here is uh, light coming towards you. 
And because of some mass here, it bends, right? So Einstein's um, equation tells you exactly how much space is bent due to how much mass. That comes straight out of Einstein's equation. That's the only thing you need. You need to know how much is the bend of space. And that gives you a certain angle through which the light will bend if it is passing by something that has a mass of, say, a star, or the mass of 10 times our, our sun, or mass of 10 to the power 10 times our sun. All that, you will get a certain quantity. And so if you know where the thing is, and you can calculate how much the light has bent. So if you look at that experiment in which uh, Eddington looked at the distortion of stars, where you had a picture of the star field without the sun, and you had a picture of a star field with the sun, and you saw how, how the, the positions shifted, that tells you how much angle through which the, the thing had to bend. From that, you can exactly measure the mass of the sun, right? Because the mass of the sun gives you how much the light will have bent, and by comparing the two. So that's, that's how you'll... So you'll the more light will bend, absolutely, and more the, the images will shift. For example, in, in particular cases where you see multiple images from the same object, right, and you can figure out that, so there are cases in which we see nine images from the same object, five images from the same object, and, and they are like that, and you can, you can find out how much they had to, the light had to move to create these multiple images. And from that, you can reconstruct um, and find the mass. And there's a very simple formula for that. And you can get this uh, in anywhere you, you, you want from textbooks or on the web. Just look up gravitational lensing. Anybody else? Uh, yes. Does somebody have a mic for her? Yeah. Oh, I'll sorry, I'll come back to you. The mic is being grabbed by somebody yeah. else there. So like, I had a yes. question about the curved space time. So you use an analogy about the bed sheet, right? Like when you put a heavy object in the middle and it bends. So if you put a sphere in, isn't it more likely to go straight in to the, the good hole point, very good instead point, of very spinning good point. around? So tell me now then, tell me then, the sun, forget about Einstein, think about in a Newton, Newtonian way, the sun is pulling the earth. Why isn't the earth falling into the sun? That's kind of one of the questions I had. Before yeah, that's the answer. question. Yeah. Right? So have you thought about that? Why isn't the earth... I mean pulled, so why am I going, I'm not going that way? Is it It's the same reason as if you take a piece, a, say a rock, and you tie a piece of string to it, and you put it on your finger, and you pull it, and you'll see things going around it, around you. It's not, you're not pulling it. You're pulling it, but it's not coming to you. It goes around you. And that is because something that is, <clears throat> is, is moving around in a circular motion has something called angular momentum, right? So there's linear momentum, is that the momentum you have if you're moving in a straight line, and then you have angular momentum if you're moving in a curved path. And in physics, angular momentum is conserved. So unless something is taking away your angular momentum, okay, it's not being destroyed, it, it's always there. So something that's moving in a curved path will stay in the curved path unless that angular momentum is taken away. Now, what can take away momentum? There are dissipative forces like friction. So if, for example, friction acts on you, that momentum can, can, can go away and your momentum can be reduced. Otherwise, momentum cannot be destroyed. In space, as the Earth is going around the sun, there's nothing there to destroy that momentum. So when the Earth-Sun system or the solar system was formed, it was formed from a nebula that was rotating. That initial angular momentum is still there. You can't destroy it. So the Earth has always been moving around the Sun, and there's nothing that is going to destroy this. So when the Earth is being pulled, what the pull is doing is keeping it in place, but it's, it's moving as well. 
right? And the pull is providing what is known as the centrifugal force, the centripetal force, right? So it's like something. So that is, but it's transverse motion cannot be destroyed, so it's always going, so you're pulling it this way, but it's going that way. And the same thing happens in the Einstein case as well, right? The, the Earth is trapped around the Sun in the curved space-time for the same reason as the Earth stays at a, at a point around the Sun in the circular orbit. But the direction in which is moving comes from its angular momentum. So is it like some initial event has caused the angular momentum, yes. but then it's the gravity that's keeping yeah. it in It's place. not an initial event. What happens is that the entire solar system formed from a gaseous nebula that itself had rotation because, because initially in the whole universe, things were formed, each one rotating with respect to each other and the net rotation in the whole universe is zero. So if something moves in that direction, some other things move in that direction, etc. So as you collapse something, its speed increases, as you know, angular momentum, angular momentum. So if it's this big and it's moving very slow, the same thing collapses, it has to move very fast to keep the same angular momentum. So now you see things moving very fast because the Earth is going around the Sun, comes from a much bigger thing, which had angular momentum. That angular momentum has not been destroyed. So this is why everything in the solar system is moving perpendicular to where it is pulled, because it has that initial momentum, right? Yeah, if that was not there, then we wouldn't exist, right? We would be inside the sun. Like, why All would we us. not exist? Hmm? Why would we not exist? Like, how is that related? So I, I didn't get you, what did you say? So why would we not exist if angular momentum was in the... Because the earth would be inside the sun. Oh, okay, okay, now, yeah, okay. We're going around the sun because of that angular momentum, right? And that's why we, we're keeping away from the sun. If that angular momentum were not there, everything will fall in. Right. <clears throat> we had a question here somewhere. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, sorry to interrupt in between. Uh, first of all, it's good idea to introduce yourself, like name and... Ah, that's a good idea. Go I should have started from. that. Yeah. Uh, Can you tell me where you're from? Uh, my name is Vidushi and I am in grade 9. I'm from Singapore. And um, so you were talking about how um, black holes, when they collide, they form ripples. But what exactly happens to their size? Do they turn from what, stellar to supermassive or...? No, not supermassive. There are two kinds of black holes and I didn't go into this detail. Um, the supermassive black holes are millions of times the mass of the sun. They are quite different things from, um, from solar mass black holes. The black holes that are a few times the mass of the sun come from stars. As they explode, they leave behind remnants that become very compact. And they are a few times the mass of the sun. And if you look at some of the pictures I showed you, I'll, I'll show you. I, I rushed through this quite a lot. Let me just go through. If you look at the... Uh, <coughs> I put the thingy. If you look at the masses of these things, this is the mass of the black hole in units of times the mass of the sun. So the things that, and, and what happens here is that each of these events are, is a LIGO event in which that black hole plus that black hole is becoming that black hole by merging. So here the most massive thing that we found is a 60 times the mass of the sun black hole merging with the 80 times the mass of the sun black hole to become something that's much heavier and it's like 160 or so. No, not 60, but yeah, there's a there's 80 something times and a, and a, and a, and a 65 times, etc. So, but the, the, the least massive black holes that LIGO has found were some of the first ones in which you have a 20 times See, the, that kind of stuff, a 20, 25 times the mass of the sun and a 30 times the mass of the sun becoming... Actually, the, the end black hole doesn't have exactly the mass as the sum of the two because there's some energy loss, some mass lost in this process which becomes the energy of the gravitational wave, E equals mc squared. So, the, that's, so that's what's happening. So something that's 20, something that's 30 times the mass of the sun, coming together, 
creating, say, 48 times the mass of the sun, and that two mass of the sun amount of matter is being converted into the wave. And there was a picture there that I also glossed over, which is this, uh, not this one, but the one here. Whoops. It's happening all the time. Um, here I had one of our students produce this picture in which the, the very first discovery that happened were these two, 1509-14, in which these are the actual sizes of the black holes that merged to form the, the bigger black hole, shown on a map of India. So these are the Schwarzschild radii, the two GM over C squared. This is the 29 plus 35, I think these were the two masses of times 29 and 36 times the mass of the sun. So if it's 29 times the mass of the sun, the size of the black hole is roughly the size of half of Karnatak, right? And uh, that's a slightly bigger one, and they become the size of Madhya Pradesh, something like that. So you think about, you're talking about the size of the black hole, because it's just 2gm over c squared, so the mass adds and becomes the, the, this, this mass. So um, that's, that's what happens. You know, so they don't turn into supermassive black holes, they just turn into a mass that's just the sum of the, sum of the two masses minus a little amount. Anybody else? Yes. <clears throat> we'll come to you. My yes. name is my name is Chaudhary and I am from Mumbai. Uh, my question was that does every black hole contain a singularity? Hmm. So we do. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very good question. I, I didn't talk about singularities at all um, because this was not a talk on black hole. Maybe somebody else will talk about black holes. What does singularity mean? I don't know what you know about singularities. But we know very little about singularities. By singularities, in general, what you can think about is that we were talking about stars collapsing to form black holes. Now, if there's nothing to stop the collapse, we don't know what the actual size of the final black hole will be. The size that we talk about here, the Schwarzschild radius, which is the 2 gm over c squared, is only the size out to which you can see from the outside. Because inside it, light cannot escape from it. But that does not tell you what the size of the black hole is. Because we don't know what stopped when the star was collapsing. And it could be that it went down to a size of zero. So what would be the density of something that has size zero? It would be infinite. So that's what's the singular. Singularity is something that is a discontinuity, it's something that's very large or very small, which cannot be quantified. And in the case of a black hole, yes, every single black hole would have a singularity, except that we don't understand singularity because we don't know, as things become very, very small, it goes into the realm of quantum mechanics, and we don't know how to bring together gravitation and quantum mechanics yet. And so we cannot tell you, here's the equation that, that describes singularity. But in a very hand-waving fashion, we can say that it is a singularity because it kind of defies the laws of um, mechanics and, and, and numbers that you quantify from things that are much bigger. So that's what a singularity is. And, and black hole is kind of a definition of singularity to some extent. Anybody else? We have here. OK. You, you decide. Here. Again. So why does well, time? Tell, you, tell us your name. Okay. I'm Manath. I'm from DPS Arkipuram in grade 11. Okay. Um, my question was, why does time move faster near a black hole? Good point. So again, something I have not talked about. Um, it, well, whether it moves faster or slower depends on where you are. Um, in, this, uh, in the relativity that Einstein formulated at the beginning, when he said that light, space-time would change to make this happen, that light speed will be the same irrespective of where it came out. right? That, that postulate that was given at the beginning. 
it has some consequences. And one of the consequences is, you know, the speed is what? Speed is distance divided by time. Right? So in order to keep the speed the same in all frames, in all coordinate systems, you have to change the definition of how you measure the length and how you measure time. Right? So this is, this is the crux of the matter. So you actually are sacrificing one thing that Newton held very sacrosanct, and that is your definition of time will not change. Your measurement of time will not change. Your interval of time will not change. And when you measure something, the length of something, it will be the same every time in every, every possible situation. Einstein says that in the real world, actually measuring the distance between two things depends on how fast they're moving. Measuring the, the time between two intervals depends on how fast things are moving. And they, they work in a way such that the ratio between the two keeps light speed constant. Okay. So, and then in the next phase of relativity, when he brought matter in, he then showed how this distortion of space-time helps in this or gets involved in this. So it turns out that near a black hole, the space-time, space-time I'm talking about now, he says now space and time are the same thing. It has to be connected. Otherwise, you can't keep C constant. So you can't change space without changing time. So whenever you, you talk about measuring the distance between two things, you'll have to talk about how you did that with respect to time. Right, and that's why space and time are the same thing. And they brought in this concept, which also I did not talk about today, was part of this great idea that space and time are connected. They form a four-dimensional continuum of space-time. So three dimensions in space and one in time. So here's a, a mind-blowing idea that comes out of this. And I'm going to throw this out, even though you didn't ask about this, but it is related to what you asked. Think of what happens when you cross the event horizon of a black hole and go inside. Inside the black hole, nothing can come out. So you can move only in one direction, but not the other. Move only in one direction, not the other. Outside a black hole, in the real world, like here, you can move in any direction. But you can move in only di one direction in time. You can't go back. So black hole is magical because inside the black hole, the event horizon, time becomes space and space becomes time. Space is one dimensional, one directional. But in time, you can move in both directions, inside a black hole. Outside a black hole, you can move in one direction in time, but anywhere in space. Right? So this is, you know, it's an extension of your question. The nature of time changes drastically as you go near a black hole and then cross the event horizon inside it. Absolutely. Where are you doing it and how are you doing it? And this is why science fiction is so dependent on black holes. If you have to do time travel, you have to go inside a black hole. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Sukriti from Bangalore. And um, my question was, you mentioned about two black holes merging to form another black hole. But what really causes these black holes to move towards each other? Does it just happen coincidentally yeah, or so. is there any event that takes no, place? No, no, no. See, everything is moving in the universe, right? And, and the thing is, the probability of two stars colliding, in, in our galaxy has 10 to the power 11 stars. And some of the stars are black holes. Black holes are stars, right? But they're just compact stars. Now, stars don't like to often just be alone. They often have a star along with them, which is a companion star. Actually, more than half of the stars in our galaxy are binary stars. So their planets should see two suns in the sky, like Tatooine. We just happened to have Jupiter, which didn't become a star. It was almost there. But it didn't become a star. 
otherwise most systems actually have two stars going around each other what if one of them is a black hole then it tries to eat the other one because it's nearby what if both of them are black holes they're going around each other and as i said the other for, for in answer to the other question when things are going around each other is nothing drawing them together they go around each other a lot because there's no friction in space but it turns out that black holes are such beasts that they they change the nature of space time a lot they curve space time a lot and so when two black holes are trapped in that their angular momentum gets destroyed very fast and this is a very interesting consequence of physics again far beyond what we are talking about today <clears throat> and so there's something which can be thought of as friction but not quite in this situation and this because both black holes are have distorted space time so much that they are virtually falling towards each other rather than keeping up this circular motion you can think about it in that way that they've dug deep holes and they're kind of coming towards each other in space time and so when two black holes are entrapped with in a binary orbit with each other very likely to eventually come close to each other and merge so that's how you get merging black holes you get merging neutron stars in fact i kind of glossed over i said all the 50 events that ligo has found are merging black holes that's not true two of them are two neutron stars merging into a black hole one of them is a black hole and a neutron star merging to form a black hole and the other 47 are two black holes forming another black hole so all the all this kind of merging happens anybody else there's a there's a hand up here and another up there sorry you were running around a lot okay isha who's first let us start and then we'll come to you yes Uh, good afternoon sir Tell i'm punya choudhury sorry i'm punya choudhury from 9th standard and i'm from mumbai um as you had said earlier that black holes are formed when we compress the mass of an object into a very like tiny space sir but how is that possible okay actually i think i think given the black hole talk because everybody is interested in black holes um I did not talk about how black holes are formed but what happens is please sit down what happens is um <clears throat> stars evolve as you know stars like our sun live for billions of years our sun has already been there for 4 and a half billion years it's going to live for another 5 billion years what happens at the end i mean i i won't use the words when stars die because you then think of something live moving around they die in the sense that they use up what what the sun is now doing is that it's producing radiation as a result of nuclear fusion in its middle by taking the hydrogen that it's made of the hydrogen is getting fused and it produces energy it will run out of hydrogen and at the end it won't be able to produce any more energy so currently the sun is there in equilibrium because it's producing energy and that keeps the bulk of the sun you know the the particles in the sun they're moving with some energy kinetic energy and that's countering the gravitation that is trying to bring the entire thing together if you if you didn't have the thermal energy of the radiation that's inside the sun then the sun would collapse because everything is attracting everything else and there's nothing to stop it but right now it is stopped by the the sheer thermal energy due to the the heat that it's producing when that process will end then there's nothing to stop the the star from collapsing so it starts to collapse at the end of the life of a star the star starts to collapse now if it's a tiny star like the sun what happens is that there are certain quantum mechanical effects that i won't go into now because this is not taught in schools but as soon as you start doing physics in in college this is the first thing you learn 
certain quantum mechanical effects come into place where the what's happening in the sun is that it's it's just full of um, hydrogen and hydrogen is essentially hydrogen nucleus which is a proton and electrons separated as they come closer to each other the electrons at some point will try to resist because they don't want to be pressed into each other very close and that's a quantum mechanical effect and that's going to stop it now whether the force of gravity that's trying to push together the star is strong enough will decide what will happen so what happens in the case of our sun is that because our sun doesn't have too much mass compared to some other stars when it runs out of fuel it will get to the stage where the electrons themselves are going to decide how small it is going to be and we now know we can actually calculate this that the sun will become something the size of the earth and it will stop radiating anything and it will become what we call a white dwarf if the star were a little more massive like twice or thrice the mass of the sun then that is not enough to keep this so it can still go further and further and further and in some cases it becomes a neutron star made of only neutrons but if a star is more than about five times the mass of the sun we can calculate this and actually this was first shown by an indian scientist called chandrashekhar in the 1930s and this is why we call this the chandrashekhar limit and stuff like that he showed that above a certain mass of the star and that is roughly about four to five times the mass of the sun this collapse cannot be stopped by any quantum mechanical force and it will keep on collapsing 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 to a very small and this is what happens so there are this basically nothing to stop the collapse of a star once it starts collapsing currently it is not collapsing because it's producing energy and that's why we are alive because we are all based on you know sun's the sun's energy once that goes then the star collapses so just another question so so the sun has limited amount of hydrogen yeah. in it yeah oh okay yeah i mean it's 2 times 10 to the power 30 kilo kilograms that's it that's the mass of the sun that's entirely hydrogen and some of it is now fused into helium so it takes hydrogen two atoms and fuses into helium once everything turns helium then there's no more hydrogen okay sir thank you